Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this edition, this event, in fact, of the Lockdown Lit Fest. As ever, we hope you are well, we hope you're keeping safe, and we hope you're being careful. I'm delighted to invite to the Lockdown Lit Fest stage a pal of mine and an author I have admired and read for so, so long. I could give you chapter and verse on his 2030 novels. I could give you chapter and verse on all the prizes and honours that he's won. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to say, Ian Rankin, a very, very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest stage. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, surviving, as we must, and desperately trying not to write a, a virus novel, because I think we'll have plenty of those to put up with next year. I think there might be a glut of those, exactly. Uh, I should point out for our audience, I'm talking to you from the virtual Lockdown Lit Fest studio, which for tonight is based in rural Warwickshire, where I'm sequestered with my 80 year old father where are you right now i am in uh, my office and my office is a one bedroom flat in central edinburgh it's my bolt hole it's my man shed it's got the living room has become my office and there's a little kitchenette off and then the bedroom has become my music room where i listen to all my records we're going to talk about your record collection and your fantastic deck and in fact your ability to play a little later on if you'll permit me what I want to start with is because, I mean, it, believe it or not, there may be some people that do not know who Rebus is. So can we start with this? Your, the first book, the first Rebus book, Knots and Crosses, how did you come up, how did Rebus introduce himself to you? I know it's weird to talk about a fictional character, you know, in terms of him being a real person, but I know the relationship between any author and their central character is so critical. Who is he, who, how, how did he appear in your authorial imagination? Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of lucky in a way. I kept a very detailed diary when I was young. And so I've got it all written up there. And it was, um, I had been into an office in Edinburgh. I was a student, postgraduate student in Edinburgh. I'd been into an office of a small publishing house called Polygon, which at that time was owned and run by Edinburgh University Students Association. And I had signed a contract on my first novel, The Flood. Mm. And the celebrations were not lengthy because I went back to my student digs in Arden Street in Edinburgh and sat staring at the gas fire and got the idea for the next book. And it was Knots and Crosses. And it just basically jumped into my head, almost fully formed. I mean, the first few pages of notes that I scribbled down on a lined pad of paper, there was this guy, he's ex-army, he's now a cop. Someone from his past is teasing him with messages, with kind of picture puzzles that are meant to mean something to him um, and he's got to work out what's going on and um, it was going to be a novel about Edinburgh, it was going to be a novel about the 1980s, it was going to hark back to literary antecedents such as Jekyll and Hyde um, because I was a PhD student doing Scottish literature. Mm. I didn't think that this guy Rebus would be around for more than one book which is why I gave him quite a silly name but he wanted to stick around, and he did stick around. You said, delighted to you, because you and I have never talked about this, but I know, I've, I've heard on the wind that you never intended to write, um, or to be a crime writer, that the, you know, your literary sort of heroes were Muriel Spark, Robert Louis Stevenson, as you said. So when suddenly, you know, the publishing industry says, oh, this is a crime novel, did that come as a bit of a shock? I remember it coming as a bit of a shock. How much of that I'm misremembering, I'm not sure. I do recall going into James Thin's bookshop, which was the independent bookshop near the university in Edinburgh, and looking for my book. I didn't find it on the fiction shelf, or indeed the Scottish literature shelf. I found it in a dark, dusty corner at the back with crime fiction, and I removed it from the crime fiction shelf in a dark, dusty corner and took it to the front of the store and put it in beside Spark and Stevenson, only to return the following day to find it was back in the crime section beside Ruth Rendell. And I remember going to, back to the university and talking to the writer in residence. There was a writer in residence who one day a week was paid to come and talk to students who might want to be writers, and it was Alan Massey, who became a great friend and a great supporter later on. And he said, I said to him, look, I seem to have written a crime novel by accident. And um, he said, well, you may never get the kudos, but you might make some cash. Nice. And as a working class kid from a coal mining village in Scotland, the idea of making some cash 
from my writing was 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 delectable because all the writers I had met up till that point were either scratching a living as a full time writer or else supported by the state doing library readings and school visits and stuff. And I wanted to make a living from my writing. And I looked around and there weren't many. I mean, there were some Scottish crime writers around at that time, but nobody was making a real go of it. Um, I mean, Dorothy Dunnett, the great historical novelist, was writing a few crime novels and there were a few others out there. Um, but I wanted to write about Edinburgh and I wanted to write about contemporary Edinburgh and I wanted to write about social issues. And um, I thought a cop is a good way of doing that. So, you know, I wanted to make a bit of cash. I was hoping the books eventually would sell enough copies that I would make a bit of cash. Um, it was a long time coming, Paul. It was a long time coming. Well, I think the, the, the crime writers these days have got it a lot easier than folk like me and Val McDermott. <laughs> Are you about to say the authorial version of I remember all this when it was all fields? I'll tell you, it's, it's the old, it's the four Yorkshiremen. <laughs> four Yorkshiremen is what it is. Um, yeah, because, you know, I mean, it was, it was a hard sell. I mean, uh, books and until train spotting came along, you'd be hard pressed to find publishers in London or elsewhere who were looking for contemporary Scottish fiction. Yeah, exactly. Um, they thought of it as another world, an alien world. And once it was proven that those books could sell in quantity, everybody was looking for the next great Scottish writer. But they were pretty thin on the ground for a long time. I remember the very early conversation you and I had back when I, was, I had the radio station of my idea. I know I, I, I claim it was my idea. It probably was yours now I think about it. But I remember a conversation we had. There was a big debate at the time that crime writing was not perceived by the industry or by audiences, but led by the industry as being proper writing. It was somehow viewed as, oh, it's a bit beyond the pale. It wasn't seen as literature. I remember you saying, no, actually, Paul, they're wrong. And here's why. Because decent crime writing deals with societal breakdown, with what happens on the edge of societal mores and when the, and when the system breaks down. And that's what Dickens was doing. If Dickens isn't literature, then we're all screwed. Do you still believe that? I do. I mean, I still turn to Bleak House, you know, every few years and I reread it because it's such a fantastic novel. It's got everything in there, including one of the first detectives in fiction. It's got a proper murder mystery, but it's got satire. It's got great characters. It's got a social critique of London and England at that time. Um, it's got the gulf between the haves and the half knots and the connective tissue between them. That's all in that book. It's an extraordinary crime novel. I mean, Dostoevsky wrote an extraordinary crime novel. Lots of people have, through the ages, written extraordinary crime novels, um, including Muriel Spark with The Driver's Seat and various other books. Um, but they were never considered as such. It's, it's more to do with where the books are placed on the shelf and uh, how they're reviewed in the newspapers and whether they're studied in schools and universities or not. And that has been changing in the last few decades since I started out. I mean, you couldn't laugh, you know, you couldn't find a, I was going to say laughably, um, you couldn't find a crime fiction course at a, a university back in the 70s and 80s. Right. But now a lot of them do. They either study crime novels as part of their course or else they have a specific um, crime fiction element. For a, for a semester or two, you can study nothing but crime fiction. And I think that's thrilling. And part of the reason for that happening is that more and more good writers have been attracted to the form. Um, writers who a generation or two back would have wanted to be thought of as literary novelists, see no shame in writing contemporary crime fiction because it's dealing with the things they want to write about, it's focused on the issues they want to focus on, and if they're lucky, it's allowing them to be a full-time writer because they're selling some copies along the way. Yeah, exactly. Here, here, and amen to that. You mentioned, when you mentioned Lords Across, you said you gave Rebus a silly name. Where did the name come from? It's a picture puzzle. I mean, a rebus is a picture puzzle, and I was very keen on puzzles and cryptic crosswords and all of that. When I was a kid, the newspaper we got on a Sunday, the Sunday Post, had a rebus in it every week for kids to try and solve, a series of drawings which would lead you to a, a secret sentence or a code word of some kind. The idea that he was getting sent these puzzles through the mail that were going to mean something to him, I thought, I'm going to give him a name that means puzzle. I possibly had looked at Morse, and thought, hang on a minute, Inspector Morse, that's a that's a code. Why can't we have Inspector Puzzle? Um, it's not a very Scottish name, I've got to say, Rebus, Rebus. It's a Polish surname. So later on in the series, we discovered that Rebus has Polish roots. I didn't know until I found out his surname was Polish. But yeah, it was playful. That first novel was a very playful novel. I mean, the whole spoiler alert, the, 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 the crime is solved because of a professor of literature at Edinburgh University who phones Rebus up and gives him the answer. 
Um, it was full of semiotics and, and deconstruction and all kinds of little games because I thought of crime fiction as a game. One of my favourite novels at that time was The Name of the Rose, Umberto yeah. Eco. I mean, I read Umberto Eco's literary criticism as a postgraduate student. Yeah. And he made a wonderful crime novel using literary criticism or using literary tropes as part of it. Yeah, I want to We're getting some noises off. What's that? I'm hearing bird song. I don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, well, sorry, I do apologize. Sorry, readers, there are noises off. This is why you pay the big money. It's live. It could be dangerous and probably will be. I this is a bit of a show off, forgive me the later. I once had the pleasure of uh, interviewing Umberto Echo. And I love this thing. We were talking about Name the Rose. And as he was doing the reading for me, he licked his little finger to turn the page. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! And I just loved him for that. Spoiler alert! Yeah, exactly. Listen, last year, if there's now a coronavirus. Um, there's now a coronavirus. One of those, isn't there? Because there's a person who's saying you've got to be careful about touching your face, and then they lick their finger to turn the next page of their speech. Have you seen that oh, one? Wow. A health minister somewhere. Oh, that's magnificent. <laughs> so, if memory serves, in fact, you just told me. To, uh, so I'm lying already. Uh, Last year was the publication of, was it In a House of Lies? Uh, in a House of Lies was two years ago. It came out in paperback last year. It came out in hardback two years ago, I think I'm right in saying, because I'm slowing down as I get older. I've not got as much vim and verve as I had when I was young. Right. And I find it harder and harder to write books. So I'm doing a book every two years. Okay. When I was young, when I, the, the Ian who sat down to write Knots and Crosses, the first Rebus novel, the moment he finished it, he probably started his next book. You know, because I just was I had ideas coming out of my ears. Yeah. But now I find the ideas quite hard, and the life of the writer, um, a lot of stuff gets in the way. Touring, interviews, the kind of stuff that I didn't need to do when I was young because nobody wanted me. Um, I mean, I was lucky if a publisher wanted me. Never mind a newspaper interview or a literary festival. Um, you know, that that takes up a lot of time, and the the job of the writer now, I'd say about seventy percent of it is not writing. Seventy percent of it is hawking your wares around the world, like a traveling salesman. And, and you open up your suitcase and there's your brushes and your miracle cleaning mops. <laughs> but the weird, bizarre thing, of course, contradiction is the more successful you get, the less chance you get to write. And that's the- I know, it's a catch, but it's a lovely catch to have. I'm not going to complain about that. No, nope, nobody complains about it. Uh, so in the House Lives is uh, record number 22. What I kind of want to tease by is how- Record number 22, well done. Well, I don't know. I think you, 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 you fed me that one earlier on, I think so. But um, I want to know, how has your relationship with Rebus changed over these, over these, over those years? All those years? Well, he um, lives in your head. And although I made, a, I made a fateful decision early on that he would live in real time. Yeah. So the last few books have been written not about a detective, but about a retired civilian. Yeah. And that's a challenge, because how does a retired civilian in his mid to late 60s become involved in a murder case, a murder inquiry? Yeah. But I like that challenge. I think that's kept the series fresh. Um, I'll see. Longer than might otherwise have been the case because it keeps me on my toes. This guy has changed. He's now got health issues that he didn't have even five or six books ago. He can't chase suspects anymore. He can't chase them down the street. I mean, he can't. He basically can't climb a flight of bloody stairs. Um, <laughs> the next book opens, the one that's going to hopefully come out in October, the next book opens with him moving. I mean, he's been in the same apartment the same flat ever since book one, but he can't manage the stairs anymore. He can't manage the tenement stairs. So the first thing that happens is he moves. Um, I'm sorry if I spoiled it for a few readers, but um, I'm sure that'll come out before the book's published. So yeah, so that is, that's a challenge, but I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the fact that, that I'm, I'm never quite sure who it is I'm going to meet when I start the new book, because his life has moved on. The lives of the other continuing characters around him have moved on. Um, his health has changed in various ways. His relationships have changed. Mm-hmm. Who is this guy? And that keeps me excited about him as a character because I want to find out what's been happening, what is happening to him now. Um, and in the new book, which I'm editing just now, um, he's going to be very careful. He's going to be very careful about his health. I mean, the, the virus. I mean, thank God I'm not writing a book set during the virus because he wouldn't be allowed to go outdoors. He'd be one of these people that have got very, you know, he'd be getting a letter from from Boris, Underlying just, you know, you've, got, you've got some health issues, pal, don't go outside. Quite. Because he's got COPD, he's got emphysema. And so anything to do with his lungs is potentially fatal. So he's going to be sitting behind his, um, the door of his flat, being left you know, donations of food and drink from um, mm. his, his few friends that he has, 
and he's going to be playing his records and he's going to be itching, itching to go to the pub. Is he in the pub? Could he be the first Zoom detective? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> you know what? Those are all getting written right now. All of these books. Every time I have a walk through Edinburgh, yeah. occasionally, because I live in central Edinburgh now, so I can walk I can walk into the centre of town and I'm not breaking any laws by doing so for my daily exercise. And there's all these shops and museums and hotels and pubs that are not only closed, mm. but I've got, you know, they're boarded up. And you think, what's behind the boarded up door? What's behind the boarded up window? Right. A body could lie in there for weeks, yeah. undiscovered. Anything could be happening behind those doors and windows. And if you're a crime writer, of course, that gets the antennae twitching. Absolutely. So who knows how many crime novels are being written at this point in time, about this point in time. Well, a couple of years' time, we'll find out. Do you still like Rebus? I've never completely liked him. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he's got very different views to me on some things. Um, Sometimes I get to hide behind him. He's, he's a bit less politically correct than I am. So you can say things that I can't or think things that I can't. He's a slightly different generation from me. So I don't always think I understand him. And I don't think he would understand me. Would I like to hang out with him? Yeah, for a while. Um, I think he's a much more interesting character than me. You know, he's, he's one of these people, if you met him in a pub, you'd be absolutely over the moon. Whereas you meet me in a pub, I'm pretty boring. I've got nothing to do. Oh, what have you done today? And written a book. <laughs> Whereas he's had adventures, he has adventures. His life is one of adventure. And so, yeah, I get to, I'll, get to, I'll get to live an adventurous life vicariously through my character. That's fascinating. Can you talk about having, because all the Rebus novels, a lot of your work, in fact, is very clearly and very consciously posited in Edinburgh. Can you talk us through what Edinburgh gives to the story and why, why it's so important? Well, I think, again, that's changed through time. When I started off, I wanted to write books about Edinburgh. I was trying to, no, not books. Even before that, when I was writing poems and short stories um, mm -hmm. as a student, I was writing about Edinburgh to make sense of Edinburgh, to explore Edinburgh, to get to know Edinburgh. Um, and it's a city of great wealth and great poverty. It's a city that's got huge social issues, but they're very well hidden from the outside world um, because the centre of Edinburgh is like this living museum of great architecture and history. Um, and the Fringe and the Festival and everything else. That's what a lot of visitors and tourists think of when they think of Edinburgh. But in the 80s, when I started writing these books, there were huge problems of social deprivation, with drugs, of course, we now know, with prostitution, gangs, you name it. Um, and it was all happening on the periphery, so nobody was really talking about it or dealing with it. And what I tried to do in the early books was to show that Edinburgh really is this Jekyll and Hyde city. Now, all beautiful cities are Jekyll and Hyde cities. We know that from the crime fiction that's set there, whether it's Barcelona or Venice or San Francisco, wherever it is in the world, there's great wealth, great poverty, social issues. There's lots of people doing terrible things. But Edinburgh's got that Jekyll and Hyde thing structurally built into it because it has existed as two towns for a long time, the old town and the new town. The old town is the original city, which stretched from the castle down to the Palace of Holyrood. Um, the new town was constructed for the kind of wealthy people uh, to be distanced from the poverty and the deprivation and the disease that was prevalent in the old town in the late 17th, early 18th century. And so you got these two towns, you got this Jekyll and Hyde and Stevenson, God bless him, Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Jekyll and Hyde, grew up posh. He grew up in a new town. His family were wealthy. Um, he was expected to go into a profession. Um, he studied law. But he dropped out. He was very interested in those two sides of Edinburgh, the dark and the light, the haves and the have-nots, the Jekyll and the Hyde. And he basically found his Jekyll and Hyde in a real character called um, Deacon William Brodie. William Brodie was a carpenter who was a deacon of rights. He was a member of society, a respectable gentleman, who at night had a gang of thieves who would break into your house, hit you over the head and steal your valuables. And he was eventually hanged on a scaffold that he had constructed because he was a carpenter. Yeah. And in Stevenson's childhood bedroom was a wardrobe that had been made by Brodie. Oh, really? And Stevenson's nursemaid would tell him the story, story of this guy who was both good and evil in the same body. And that must have got hardwired so that decades later, Stevenson would come to write Jekyll and Hyde. And to me, that was, that was a continuing story. I just wanted to continue that story and Rebus allowed me to do it. And so well. What, I mean, it's... You've been so successful. You have such a wide and loyal readership. 
when you're penny, I know you're working on editing a new book at the minute, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Do you block all that sort of background white noise out when you're writing, or do, does it sit there on your shoulder saying, "This is what they're going to expect. This is, you know, I have obligations, I have responsibilities now." How does that work? That's a really good question. It's a very good question. Um, I hope I'm not lazy. I mean, I could be lazy and just write the kind of book everybody's expecting. Yeah. But I do try and move Rebus on and, move, and and push the reader to 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 work a little bit harder than might otherwise be the case. Um, I know that the books don't have as many, not as much in the way of puns and word plays they used to have because I know that translators found that very difficult. Yeah. So that's one thing that's changed a lot in the books. I try not to think of the audience. I still, when I sit down, the person I'm up against is me. Um, Am I going to write a better book than my previous books? Am I going to write a book that's fresh and interesting? Am I going to be interested not only to read it, but to write it? Is it exciting? And I do block out the outside world as much as possible. I come to my little flat here. I sit in this little living room, um, put some background music on, and I just work. And it's just me and the story fighting each other um, for a few months. And it doesn't get any easier. I kind of wish it did. But if it got easier, maybe I would get lazy. And you're not only up against yourself, you're also up against all, all these other writers, these myriad crime writers now, these young, fresh, nimble crime writers full of, full of vim and vigor who want your sales uh, and want your fan base. And so you've got to, you can't get lazy. You cannot get lazy. And the great writers never did. Ruth Rendell never got lazy, I don't think. P.D. James never got lazy. I don't think Reginald Hill ever got lazy. They kept changing they kept pushing themselves. They tried to make each book better than the book before, to be different, to be fresh, all of that. Um, it's just part of the territory. It's what you do. At the same time, you know, when it's going well, it's still the most fun thing in the world. It, it shouldn't always be hard. It should also be fun. And the, the writer who's writing the story should maintain or retain a little bit of the, the, the them that they had in childhood when they hopefully had a creative inner life and we're playing games, role-playing games with their imaginary friend. I think that's getting harder for young people. Um, but I certainly remember it when I was young. And that's what I do. I'm still the Ian Rankin who scribbled stories, cartoons, song lyrics, all kinds of things in his bedroom because he was bored. I know you, I know you to have a very highly calibrated moral compass. And forgive me for not sparing your blushes. And I know you're the last person on earth to sort of pull the ladder up after him, but more likely to help somebody up the ladder behind you. Who are you reading? Who have you read lately that you see coming up behind you? Who are the young writers that you think they've got it? They've got it. They're going to be me in 10 years time. Oh man. I'd have to leave this. I'd have to leave this room and go and check out all the books I've read recently, or I'd have to check my phone, which has got a list of all the books because my brain, when I'm writing a book, my brain is in another place. So I'm going to forget names. Okay. I mean, I've read a few. I read a one really, a guy called Matt Osman, who's known as, he's a member of the band um, Suede, and, and he's the brother of Richard Osman, who we all know from television, who's also got a crime novel coming out. But Matt Osman's written a book called The Ruins, which is a really strange, wonderful first novel, um, which has got quite a lot of Thomas Pynchon in it. And I was a huge Thomas Pynchon fan oh, when I was young. Wow. So it's got a lot of conspiracy theories. It's a very, it's a, it's a very sinuous book. It's very uh, textural. It, there's a mystery in it. It's got music in it. It's about a, a kind of enigmatic musician um, and his brother dealing with this musician's death. Um, there's all kinds of great, amazing. It takes you into a kind of a slightly different, a parallel world, a parallel world that isn't quite our world. Um, and I found it very readable for a big, big long book. Uh, Emma Viskic, Viskic is a an Australian writer I've come across recently, although she's been around for a few books now. And she's got a detective who's who's deaf, and that's a really interesting. She's not, by no means the only writer now with a deaf detective. I can think of a couple, but they're really well done. And I always like reading about contemporary Australia. Um, ah, there's a lot. You know what? I'm looking at my to be read pile. I've got a pile about a meter high of books that I've yet to get around to reading. Don't worry. Don't worry. I mean, you know what I'm finding with this lockdown, man? I'm, I can write. I can write to my heart's content. It doesn't bother me at all. When I sit down to read a book, the concentration goes. My brain no. is just gone. So what I'm doing is instead of having one book that I will read from beginning to end, I've got about half a dozen on the go at any one time. And I'll tell you what I'm reading just now, which is not a crime novel, and it's not by a young writer. I'm reading John Carey's A Small History of Poetry. 
Oh, how lovely. Which it is, because it's just these little capsule lives of poets from the very beginning, from the mists of time to the present day, pretty much. And it just makes me go back and read the poets. Isn't it, it makes me go back and read the poets. And you know what? A lot of novelists, and I'm one of them, are incredibly jealous of poets. Because a poet can say in a stanza or a couplet what it takes me 300 bloody pages to say. Yeah, but poets very rarely get your sales, Ian, so be careful what you wish for. You're right. But, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm attracted to Muriel Spark as a writer, because she could do both. Yeah, exactly. And you carry, can't Kerry turn a sentence in that book as well? Oh, Kerry's great. I, know he's, I mean, he's, he, he brings it all to life. But um, I'm thinking of Muriel Spark, sadly, does not make it into his book. But she, she thought of herself as a poet. And if you go and see her grave, which I have done near Arezzo in Italy, where she lived, it just says in it, Muriel Spark, Poeta. Poeta. It doesn't say novelist or anything else, poet. And no. I'm very jealous of writers who can turn their hand to poetry and prose. Well, you've dabbled in poetry. Yeah, not for a long time, man. Song lyrics, I do song lyrics now. I'm back well, doing song lyrics again. Okay, go on. Five minutes, let's talk about music. You've got a hell of a record collection. You've also got a band. What, what role does music play in your life? How important is it to you? What does it bring to the writing? I'm not sure what it brings to the writing, but I am a frustrated rock star like many, many writers I know, and a lot of us use music in our books as a way to get around that. Uh, and because I use music in the books so much, it has introduced me to a lot of musicians, and I've been able to go, not only get to know them, I've got to work with them in, in some cases, whether it was making an album with a singer-songwriter called Jackie Levin, yeah. um, where I did some spoken word stuff and he did some songs, uh, whether it's contributing a little spoken word piece to an album by the Charlatans, uh, you know, writing lyrics for bands, just, it's been great. It's been fantastic. And, and you know, I, I got the chance to join a band fairly recently, a couple of years ago, called Best Picture. And I'm the vocalist, so I get to write the words. And we did some gigs just before Christmas. Um, we don't gig very often because half the band are in another band um, and because we've all got day jobs. So it's basically a bunch of guys, mostly in their 50s, who should know better, but somehow we just want to get out there and, and, and play. Well, you say a bunch of guys, isn't it? Was it Kenny? If I remember this wrongly, isn't it Ewan McCall, Kenny Farquharson, and is it Bobby, Bobby Bluebell on, on yep. uh, the fretboard on guitar? Yep. Yep. You. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, what? I mean, Bobby, Bobby from the Bluebells, that's, I mean, I feel, you know, young at heart. That's him. So he's in a fairly successful band. Um, Ewan uh, and Kenny are both full time journalists. Um, Stuart is a lecturer in statistics, and now he's going to he's going to kick me in the head for not remembering exactly what he does. But he's a, he's, he's in he's in London now. He's a professor or a lecturer in London, so we don't see him very often. And our keyboard player left and joined another band, so that was a little bit sad. Um, and me on vocals. Are, yeah. you looking, are you looking for a new keyboard player? No, I've I've taken over keyboard duties by playing kazoo. Uh, in, in all the keyboard solos where there are no kazoo solos, which is very entertaining. <laughs> Humphrey Littleton would be very proud of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, listen, Ian, you're pretty active on Twitter. Uh, and I follow you and I love your tweets because they go, but there was a very gnomic one you put out recently, which just had a book cover. And on the, on the rubric on the book cover, it said, A Song for the Dark Times. Can you tell us what that's about, please? That's about... 100,000 words of um, the oh, next well. novel. Yeah, I know. That's an old gag. Ian Banks used to tell that one all the time. Um, yeah, it's the latest Rebus book. And um, A Song for the Dark Times is a misquotation from something Bertolt Brecht said. Um, someone saying, um, you know, uh, will, there, will there be uh, songs when, when in the dark times? When the dark times come, will there be songs? Yes, there will be songs about the dark times. Something like that. I'm, I'm misremembering it badly. But I just thought back October, November last year, when I was starting to get the idea for the book, I thought, these are dark times. Felt to me last year, October, November, these are dark times. What's happening in the world? It's a very dark place and a very dark period of our history. Um, the rise of various regimes and autocrats and the rise of the right wing in some countries and anti-Semitism beginning to rear its ugly head again. And things happening in the USA and things happening in the UK and countries beginning to put up borders again and barriers and fear of the outsider and fear of the, the stranger. And I just thought these are dark times. Little did I know that those were the good times. Those were the halcyon days, Paul, the halcyon days of October, November last year. How I wish we were back there again. So yeah, it's called A Song for the Dark Times. Rebus um, heads up to the north coast of Scotland where his uh, daughter lives. They've been estranged for many years, but she's in trouble. So that takes him away from Edinburgh 
and fans might be slightly disappointed that a good chunk of the book is not set in Edinburgh, it's set up north with Rebus, where he's completely a fish out of water, completely a very small coastal community of a few hundred people on a, on a, you know, a very slender road with passing places and very few bars. Um, and he's out of his depth. Uh, and then back in Edinburgh, Siobhan Clark and Malcolm Fox, the two main police protagonists in the books, are dealing with a murder case of a um, rich overseas student who's been stabbed to death in the wrong part of town. And the two cases start, they start to get little connections between them. And uh, as usual for me, when I started the book, I didn't know where the hell it was going to go. I wanted to take Rebus up north, connect him with his daughter again. How could I do that? Something's happened that involves her. That was it. That was the motor. And then the rest of it, I just made up. That's I just awesome. made it up. Uh, when you come to, how do you know when you come to the end of it? I mean, obviously it's solving. The <laughs> but how, is, is, that a, is that a difficult thing? Do you uh, have to wrap it all up? There's a great book called The Sense of an Ending. Uh, which was a literary theory book one. Yeah, how do you know when you get to the end? Um, it just it's 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 organic. The book tells me. The book says, okay, we're just look that that leads to that, that leads to that, that leads to that, that leads to the end. This is us now reaching the end. Uh, you've done what you need to do. You've been through all the red herrings. You've taken Rebus here. You've taken Rebus there. You've in, introduced this. You've introduced that. You've explained this. You've explained that. It's the end. Uh, and and then I decide, okay, how many pages is that? Oh, that's enough. That's enough. This book I thought was going to be really short, and it ended up being actually quite long. Um, I mean, it's longer than my last two or three Rebus novels. I mean, it's getting up towards 100,000 words. Um, but you know what? I've not actually – I don't do word counts or page counts or anything, and I've not checked it, and I've just – I'm editing it just now. The Schrodinger's book. Every author writes Schrodinger's book. <laughs> Until you show it to another human being, it is perfect, it is crystalline, it's exactly what you want to say about the world. It's the best you can possibly make it. Yeah. Then you make the mistake of showing it to people. <laughs> and that's when you know if the cat is alive or dead. And the first person who gets it is my wife. And we're, we're, we're Luddites, so I print it off, A4 paper, hand her this huge wadge of paper, and she goes through it and sits there for days, penciling in the margins. Pencil, 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 pencil. And I sit there going, what's she doing? What's she doing? What doesn't she like? What doesn't she like? And then she hands it over. And at the same time, it's been to my editor. And he's emailed me back a big list of things he thinks are wrong with it. Yeah. And my agent will say, well, what about this or what about that? Or I don't understand this or I don't understand that. I collate all those commentaries and I do another draft. Some of them I agree with, some of them I don't, some of them I change, some of them I don't. But it has ceased to be the perfect novel. So what can I do now? I've got to go and write another book to try and write the perfect novel. Even in my own little way, taking myself back to my sort of 14, 50-year-old self, you know, really getting engaged with literature. I mean, my mum brought me up to read from the age of two, three years old. I had a, I'm going to pay him some respect. I had an English master called Stephen Tranter, who I really always wanted to do my best for. And like you, every essay I wrote was crafted. I sweated blood <laughs> it, and it was brilliant. It was the best thing I could do. But there was something weird about that transaction of handing the paper over to him. And the moment his skin touched it, I knew I'd let him down. <laughs> Never got over that. So I've got I, some quotes that I, keep. I don't have much in front of me when I write, but I've got several quotes. I'm just going to grab them. Hang on a sec. Oh, please do. They're stuck with blue tack onto the side of my bookcase. Okay, so one is a guy called Anthony Giardina, don't ask me who he is, quoted on Twitter by the Paris Review. Right. And what he says is, doubt is your friend when you're writing a novel. Nice. Doubt nice. is your friend when you're writing a novel. Now, Milan Kundera, no less, <laughs> um, wrote, the wisdom of the novel comes from having a question for everything. Nice. Not the answer. The question. question. That's what I think the, the, what the, the crime novels do is they're asking questions of the audience. Of course. And then Iris Murdoch, this is my favourite. I don't know if you can see that. It's my favourite. It's all faded now. Every book is the wreck of a perfect idea. It's exactly oh. what you were just talking about. Every book is the wreck of a perfect yeah. idea, which is when that's when you, you that's because, so when you finish the book, what do you do? You go off and try and fail better next time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, just so you know. 
Ian Rankin is sitting at his writing desk, and these are the quotes above his desk. We are in honoured, honoured, <laughs> hallowed ground. Ian, listen, the, there was a rediscovered one you were talking about called West Wind. What's the gig there? Um, West Wind is a book that I, I wrote, wrote back in the late 80s, early 90s that was my attempt to, to become a, a huge million-selling thriller writer. It was a techno thriller. How did my that go? A techno thriller. And it had space shuttles and spy satellites and all kinds of high-tech stuff in it, which is now very low-tech, uh, up to and including um, central locking on cars. Ooh, I was obviously enthralled to central locking on cars. Not remote central locking, not that, but oh. actually turning the key and all the locks drop. That was obviously a new thing. I mentioned it 12 times in the book. Anyway, um, it went through very many tortuous permutations. It went through very many publishers, houses, editors, agents, being rejected, being tweaked. Someone would tell me to change it, I would change it, I would change it, I would change it, I would change it, until it ceased, in my mind, to be in my book anymore. And so it was published to no acclaim and no sales, and I said it's never going to be reissued, never. So I think it was published in 1990. Okay. Last year, someone on Twitter said, I got hold of that book, and I like that book. I don't know why you don't like it. So I picked a, I had a copy on the shelf and I picked it up and read it. And I thought, this isn't bad. And it had been 30 years since I'd read it. So I didn't remember any of the plot, any of the characters. I just read it as a reader. I didn't read it as a person who'd written it. I thought, this is good. This is pretty good. And I knew that I didn't have a book coming out last year. It was a year off. I wasn't writing a book. So I said to my publisher, do you want a little something to put out in time for Christmas? And they went, yes, please. So with my editor, Emad, we went through it and we tweaked it a little bit, but not too much, tidied it up, got rid of some of the clunky writing. There were some clunky sentences and stuff. And we put it up and people were, were fairly complimentary about it. it was a nice surprise. It was a lovely surprise that a book that I didn't have any love for, yeah. I now love. And that's coming out, if I remember so, is that coming, coming out in paperback? Hopefully, I think it's coming out next month in paperback, but who knows with this lockdown whether yeah. that will still be the case or not. People can check it out. Um, hopefully it's coming out next month in paperback. We shall help them check it out. Have a look below the screen. We'll see if we can sort something out for uh, West Wind. So there should be a button at some stage. One last book we'll mention, because I, I died to find out what the hell happened to it. First thing you ever wrote, Summer Rights. Apparently still in the bottom drawer. When did you last look at that? I've not looked at that for a long time. It was lost for years. It was lost because it was written when I was a student. It was typed on an old portable typewriter. I couldn't afford to photocopy it, so there was no copy. There was just a manuscript, which I would blithely put in an envelope and send to London, and it would blithely be sent back again with a rejection letter. It could have been lost at any point in time. Anyway, we moved to France, and we moved from France back to Edinburgh, and eventually it came to light again in a chest, you know, somewhere. I don't know. Um, and it's still there. It's still this this block of text because at that time I didn't know that after a comma or a full stop you should put a, a, a little space and I didn't know not to put it in single lines so it's all so just a huge chunk of compressed black ink which must be almost unreadable to anybody it's my wife's favorite book of mine um she loved it to bits it's a comedy set in a, a highland hotel highlands of scotland hotel and it features a schizophrenic librarian with one leg and a kid with special powers, kinetic powers or something. Where did this spring uh, from? Christ knows. I've no idea. It's a comedy. I've no idea where it came from. I know. I just wanted. To, I just. I felt like writing at the time. You know, just what I wanted to write. I wanted to write that book, so that book got written, and I sent it off to um, Galax. Who oh, writes? I won second prize in a short story competition, and the winner, Ian Crichton Smith, was published by Galax. His fiction was published by Galax. And he said, look, I'll write a letter to my editor, Livia Galanx, daughter of the, the founder. Yeah. Um, and, and he duly did. And so I sent it to her and she read it and she wrote me back. I can't find the letter now. Really frustratingly, I cannot find the letter. She sent me back a letter and said, look, the first two thirds of this are very good, but the last third needs an awful lot of work. And I went, what does she know? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, you, you just published the book. I've sent it like Snoopy. Have you ever seen that Snoopy cartoon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, I think you may have misunderstood, Mr. Publisher. What I want you to do now is publish the book. You know, That's not the job. The head of the book, just publish it. <laughs> I said, I thought you did. I edit it. You got to be joking. This is it. This is the book. This is the story I want to tell. It's oh, perfect. It's That's why it's never published. Oh, how funny. Does it have a yeah. title? Summer Rights, R I T E S. Summer Rights. So, um, Good title. 
it's a good title. It is a good title. And it is, it's in this building somewhere. I mean, it's in one of these cupboards or I don't know. Right, I'm setting off now. I'm cycling up to you. I'll be with you in about three months. Yeah, no. and we'll yeah, have the final year. Here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> right, last thing. I hate to bring this up. I mean, I'm getting to be a man of a certain age. Um, and so are you, it seems. Yeah, I get my bus pass at the end of April. Um, really? Get my bus pass. I'm going to be 60. I would say I'll get my bus pass, but in fact, the office isn't open, so I can't go and get my bus pass at the moment. It's. Uh, Shut for the virus. Um, yes, 60 years old, man. And I had huge ideas for celebrations, parties for friends, dinners with people. I'm going to go and see a film on the actual day itself with my wife and son. I'd already bought the tickets for that. Um, but, you know, I don't think I need all that fuss. I think I'm just going to sit and have a quiet dinner at home and maybe watch the telly. I think that's what I'm going to do on the 28th of April. I'm going to have a quiet one. Maybe I'll have a birthday, birthday on Twitter. I'll have a Twitter birthday. Or do a Zoom uh, birthday. Yeah, whatever. Get, you know, I don't know. I don't, none of my friends can work this shit. Nobody I know can work this technology. I still listen to records, Paul. All my mates listen. We've got record players. We buy records. We put the record on. We listen to it. We don't stream music. Yeah, but um, CDs to... are a newfangled technology for us. Yeah, but listen, man. You you are now live, proud in your in your own writing room in the virtual lockdown lit press studio. <laughs> you couldn't be more zeitgeisty if you tried it. <laughs> I know, but it's hurting my head to do it, man. It really is hurting my head. <laughs> I'd much rather be sitting there in a pub. Yeah, well, let, let, come, let's end on that then. We can't talk about you. We can't talk about Rebus without invoking the name the Oxford. For those that don't know, what's the Oxford and why the hell aren't you in it? Yeah, I know. Well, the Oxford Bar is a, a bar that uh, was introduced to by a student friend of mine. He was a barman in there, a part-time barman. And I was just at the start of writing the first Rebus novel. And I looked at it and thought, this is where my guy would drink. It's no bells, no whistles, central Edinburgh, but hidden away. So it was part of that hidden Edinburgh I was trying to write about. Um, there's no music, no jukebox, TVs hardly ever on. It was just about conversation, a nice safe place to have a chat, wind down, escape from the real world. Um, and so that's where Rebus drinks. And I've been drinking there since about 1984, 85, I guess. I had my stag party in there in July 1986 before I got married. I had my last drink in there the day before the lockdown. I think it was literally the day before the lockdown and I walked past, I happened to walk past and I thought, I'll just see how they're doing. And the place was pretty empty then. The kind of word was getting around that we should all be getting a bit careful. Mm. And Kirsty, who owns it, she's not owned it for very long, God bless her. And uh, I thought I've just got to buy a drink. So I went in and I had one drink and then walked away from the Oxford bar. And I'm hoping that when this is all over, the Oxford bar will still be there for me to walk back into and for Rebus to walk back into. Exactly. We can but hope. Sending all our love to you at the Oxford bar um, and you, Kirsty. Listen, I'm going, to put a, I'm going to put a plea out now. Ian Rankin, one of the nation's favourite crime writers, celebrates his 60th birthday on the 28th of April, 2020. He's on Twitter. So are you. You know what to do. <laughs> let's make him, let's see if we can get Ian to trend globally on Twitter on his 60th birthday. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. aye. Ian, <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. Give my love to your wife, your family. And look after yourself. And thank you so much for joining us. And we'll, uh, we'll be tweeting all the way through to the 28th of April. Thank you so much for joining us at the lockdown. Well, Paul, thank you for inviting me, man. This is a great initiative of yours, and these are strange days, strange days for readers, strange days for writers, strange days for all of us, and we're all taking little tippy-toe steps into the 21st century. So God bless you. Take care, everybody. Actually, before you go, is there anything you want to say to your readers? To Rebus, don't go fucking out. No, don't go your, out. Do your, not go out. Not Rebus, to your readers. Oh, to readers, like I said, to Rebus. Yeah. Don't go out. Uh, well, the same thing to the readers. No, I mean, you know... Uh, Take care, look after each other, keep in touch as much as you can, whatever it takes, whether it's new technology or whether it's picking up the phone or writing a letter. My son, bless him, has written a postcard to his granny in Belfast. Just keep it in touch like that. Post offices are still open. You can buy a stamp. Um, and, yeah, and read a lot. And please don't try writing crime fiction set in Edinburgh, please. There's plenty of competition. <laughs> Well, you've been watching Ian Rankin and me having a lovely old chat here at the Lockdown Lit Fest studio. Thank you so much for joining us. And as ever, be well, stay well, take care and look after the people you love. From Ian Rankin and from me, Paul Blazard, over and out.